as I hadn't exactly planned to do this, I volunteered. Um, it just seemed like something fun to do because I've worked on this thing for so many years, and now that I'm basically just a talking head and everybody else does the work, I'm like, I, it's okay, I feel, I feel like I, I'm across that line now. So what I'm going, to, I'm going to do is talk about data breaches, and I'm going to talk about it in a way that is a little less than normal. Most people are like, ha, ah, look at them, they got pantsed, and that's never a good thing. And I've been through this for quite a long time. So quick introduction for those of you who don't know me. Um, thank you, the resolution doesn't work there. I, my name is Dave Lewis. I have been doing this sort of thing for about 25 odd years, give or take. Uh, if we go even further back, I was duping video games and selling them to kids in school in 1983. So I self-identify as a hacker. I like to use that word as our word because I like to use the term attacker for the criminal event. So if you look on Google, you'll find not everybody likes us all that much. It's a little bit disconcerting at the best of times. But one of the interesting things is, as a part of my role, I get to travel the world and have, give talks all over the place. And it's really, really rewarding. So I get to you know, trumpet the flag, so much so that I actually got a tattoo on my arm of a maple leaf because of something that happened in India a couple of years ago. I was in a hotel there, and I was just getting ready to check out to go on to my next destination. And this well-dressed woman comes up to me, and she goes, excuse me, are you an American? I said, no, actually, I'm from Canada. She goes, good. Never been so scared in my life. What would have happened if I said yes? <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that one out. So generally speaking, when I'm talking to folks around the world, I say we're usually dressed up as homicidal maniacs going across a sheet of, a sheet of ice at a long, uh, high rate of speed. My tongue just tripped. Um, I do work for Duo. I'm a, uh, uh, <clears throat> I do talking and stuff. Um, I, <laughs> I give talks around the world about 40 times a year. Uh, we got bought by Cisco a year ago. And the one thing that really um, got me to talk about this in the first place was data breaches. So data breaches are something that have been near and dear to my heart for a very, very long time. Um, if we go back, um, uh, it's around 2012, I'll talk to about that in a little bit. Uh, I really started tracking them. And one thing that I noticed is that nobody really goes through and has a set nomenclature that they stick to. They don't have a conversation where they say, okay, these are, the, these are how, what happened, this is how it happened, these are the lessons learned, and then sharing it beyond that. And it really bothers me because they're like, oh, yeah, it's okay. We lost that Windows laptop, but it's okay because it had a password. Um, not going to work. So I, last, for the last three years, I have gone through every possible uh, publicly available data breach notification I could find to read them. If you ever have trouble sleeping, easy, easy way to fix that. There is so much of this to go through. And the one thing that I was like hoping to do is have some trending analysis, some sort of you know, statistics that I could go through. But it was such a dog's breakfast that I couldn't do that. And it's really amazing as we're going through this, and then people are saying, oh, we do it this way, we do it this way, we do it this way. And it's like there's no commonality. And people really look at things from a very wrong perspective in so many different ways. So one of the things that really gets me is when we're talking about security, we like to talk about, oh, we have a firewall, everything's fine. Oh, we have a perimeter, everything's fine. So before I ever got into this racket, I did a degree in classical studies and archaeology, and one of the stories that came up along the line was the sack of Rome in 410 AD. So this is when the Visigoths showed up. They took over the city simply by not letting anybody in or out of the city. They used their own perimeter defense against them as a weapon. Now we flash forward to 2019. We still have organizations that are going, it's okay, we have a firewall, and they have a completely flat interior. I know, I've worked at some of these companies. And this is a really vexing thing because we can do a far better job. Now, when we look back in time, we look at different types of data breaches. We look here in uh, 2005, where 40 million credit cards were dumped, and there's Heartland processing, where there was an uh, untold amount there. We're going through, and we're like, why did this start keep happening? Why were all of these credit cards being dumped? And a lot of it was because of the law of unintended consequences. So XP Command Shell was a uh, tool that was built into a lot of database, databases rather, that would allow the database administrator to remotely administer the database. It was put there with the best intentions. It was the road to hell is paved with those. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times you would see databases being pro promoted into production with this still enabled. I was at one company where we had penetration testers come in and start doing uh, testing on us. And one of the first things they tried was this. Thankfully, that was disabled. And it was really funny because I texted them at the same time. They're like, that's not going to work. And they're like, who told you? It's like, 
I'm actually looking at the intr uh, intrusion detection system. Now, data breaches are a really frustrating thing for me because they keep happening. How many people in here are familiar with Amazon's S3 buckets? Show of hands. Awesome. That's probably the best turnout I've ever had when I've said that. Um, the really frustrating thing here is that anybody with a credit card and a web browser can spin one of these up. And by and large, the folks that are setting up S3 buckets, for those of you who don't know, it's a data repository. You can put whatever you want in it, images, flat files, whatever it happens to be. The problem here is that we as security professionals haven't done a very good job of telling the folks that don't know why this is a problem when they spin these up to make them not publicly available. Because there have been so many data breaches that have happened where an S3 bucket was exposed, but it didn't have to happen that way. Now, the really funny thing is, is it, throughout my career, I do, I've learned a lot of lessons and I've made a lot of mistakes. And along the way, I've collected all sorts of stories, which I write for various publications. One story that I did with Forbes, <coughs> excuse me, I went through and I set up an S3 bucket, took screenshots, put it through in the steps. There's a huge banner across the page saying, do not mark this public because then people can find it. There are scanning tools that are freely available on GitHub that will iterate through S3 buckets looking for these sorts of data repositories. And people will keep getting hit. Now, when I put these sort of names up here, this is not to guilt anybody. This is to show this could literally happen to anyone. And they keep happening. Now, it really doesn't get really personal for folks until it happens to them. And I myself have suffered through a data breach years ago. And like, for those of you who don't know, I've been in the Toronto area for about 25 years working on, in various companies. And we had one organization was at, we had a data breach, and it was really, really frustrating. Um, and I know how painful those things can be. But it doesn't really seem to resonate with people until they have their own data breach, until it hits the home because they don't understand the value of the data they're protecting, be it source code, customer information, whatever it happens to be. And that is really where it gets kind of vexing. <coughs> now, no, con no uh, conversation would be complete without your mandatory you know, machine learning AI sort of nonsense, but this is just it. The attackers have the ability to do, use these sort of tools. The, there are tools out there where you can go through, like Amazon SageMaker and other things like that, where you can create your own. You can create your own applications. This is one of those things you can go through. Now, the thing is, most of the times the attackers will never, ever go to this extent. Why? Because they don't have to. We as defenders leave too many low-hanging fruit and it allows the attackers to get in. But it is possible that this can happen. Now, uh, one of the roles that I have is I do speaker operations at DEF CON every year. And then one year we had this. It was the DARPA Grand Challenge where they had uh, all these supercomputers across the stage were attacking each other. And it was really an interesting uh, event. Behind the stage, there were huge tubes or uh, hoses full of water just to cool these things. But the really interesting thing is at one point, one of the machines created an attack that nobody had seen before. It created its own attack against another machine. So. The possibility is there, but I wouldn't even begin to worry about that yet because we still make it far too easy for the attackers. And flash uh, warning, um, attackers will try anything. Sorry about that. So when we look back and we look at the Equifax uh, breach that happened not too long ago, or actually a while ago now, but this is a great lesson learned because everybody's like, oh, they got popped, they got through this, they got through that. It's like, the problem here is, Brian Krebs pointed out one really interesting thing, and also Brian Krebs is not your IDS system. He pointed out that there was a web interface <coughs> that was available with easily guessed credentials that would get you to the exact same data, and this interface showed up in 26 different countries, I think it was. This was a very easily guessed username and password. This is just it. The attackers don't have to drop any sort of zero day or any sort of exploit when they can just log in and get it. And the, and the media, and I've been guilty of this as well, talk about things, but we don't always talk about the right things. So you hear about unauthorized access, the insider threat, everybody talks about that, web breaches, but they usually don't talk about the missing patches because nobody wants to talk about that. But this is just it. These are the sort of things that we have to make sure that we're spending time to focus on so we are securing our environments. Now, I absolutely love Star Wars, so I'm going to liberally rip off uh, Rogue One because Rogue One really hit me as one of the best data breach movies that was ever made. So first, you have your firewall admin. He's working away there. 
And he's like, okay, I'm, I'm doing my job. I'm going to take my coffee break in a little bit. Oh, wait, somebody used the wrong password. Wait, why are you here? You're not supposed to be here. You're not scheduled to be here. And they're like, oh, don't worry about it. We got redirected. It's no problem. You know, it, everything's cool. And he's like, okay, send me the code. There's your SQL injection. He's like, oh, yeah, no problem. In you go. So off they go into um, their destination. Now, if this was an attacker getting into a site, if you believe any of the reports out there, like Pokemon or any of the other ones, you'll see that it's like 200 days on average before anybody notices they've been breached. If this statistic is actually true, this would take quite a long time. Now, once the attackers are in, they try to escalate their privilege. Obviously, they want to get around and get more information. <coughs> By this point, there's so much damage done, it's kind of hard to recover. But eventually, the indicators of compromise show up when everything starts blowing up. But by that point, it's kind of too late. The attackers are in, they've got their beachhead, and the egress filtering has already begun. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, wait, the data, there it goes. But the best part about this is, as we go through this, is we realize that at no point was that data encrypted. So even in the future or the past, depending on how this movie timeline goes, things were really bad. Now, back in 2012, I started tracking data breaches. And this was one of those things where I went through. And I was just on my website, liquidmatrix.org. I was tracking all these. And this was one here, LinkedIn, 6.5 million records. This was headline news in 2012. Everybody was talking about this. Now here we are in 2019 talking about orders of magnitude of billions of records. How is it that this keeps getting worse? We have to be able to do a better job of this. And I know what it feels like because I've been there. This is a web page that was uh, for a company that I was working at that got compromised. Came into work one morning, the phone was ringing off the hook, and there's several different media companies, CBC, Globe Mail, all the rest of it. They're like, oh, yeah, you got breached. We want to talk to you. And I'm like, what? This was a server that was part of a marketing team that was supposed to have been taken offline. I contacted the marketing team. They said, it's OK. It's going to be taken offline. Two weeks later, this happens. Was I mad at them? No. Why? Because I, at no point, and my team, at no point, did we follow up with them to make sure this had been taken offline. This was using a deprecated version of WordPress. Well, you had me at WordPress. Um, and they got in, and they were able to mess around. But thankfully, sheer luck, this was no longer connected to any backend systems. <coughs> so that was really dumb luck. But the uh, reputational damage had already been done. Now, when we look at the attackers and we go through, like this is data that I had from my previous job uh, when I worked at Akamai, we go through and quarter over quarter, this was the attack patterns that we would see, hands down. SQL injection, local file inclusion, cross-site scripting were always the top three attacks. Why? Because they work. And that's the really frustrating thing, because you go through and you look at the data breaches, you say, OK, this was a couple years ago. And it's like, wow, that is something else. And then six months ago, it's like, OK, this is getting a whole lot worse. So two, a couple of years ago, six months ago, and roughly a couple of weeks ago. So this is a site called informationisbeautiful.net. They do uh, data visualization for all sorts of data sets, one of them being data breaches. This is really cool. But it's been so hard for them that they uh, go, go back. They had to redesign their interface because it's been getting so crazy. So. And it feels like everybody wants a data breach. And a lot of the problem is, when we look at it, is like, are we using the right security controls? <laughs> Not always. And then we have problems that come back at us, like security debt, like this. When this happened, for those of you who don't know, that's WannaCry. When, these, when this happened, that frustrated the hell out of me, because this was a vulnerability we had known collectively for 10 years, and yet, it happened. So when you have a data breach, you have to look at the various types of costs that you have to worry about. The cost of investigating the incident, remediating the findings. Ever been in an organization where you get popped and you get a list of things to do, and the manager goes, oh, no, that's OK. We're good. We will just accept the risk. Yeah, frustrating. Communications that you have to do. So when we had our data breach, we had to communicate with external uh, folks, internal folks, shareholders. It was an absolute nightmare. And there was no actual damage done beyond reputational. That was really, really frustrating. You got to look at the legal fees and goes on from there, potential loss of revenue. 
one of the really interesting things is one of the side gigs that I do is I work with a group called Securosis where we went through and we looked at data breaches over time. And it was amazing that over time, each one of these companies that got popped, their stock went up afterwards. So maybe they do really want a data breach. I don't know. <laughs> but there are costs that we have to look at. Like, for example, when Verizon was looking to buy uh, Yahoo, and Yahoo uh, failed to mention that they had gotten breached, and that caused a $350 million haircut on the deal price. So that could have actually gone very, very much worse than that. And then we look at things like this, where a company said, oh, it's OK. We don't need to do encryption because nobody told us we had to. That was an actual rough, actual quote from a, a party at that company. This is amazing to me. So we, we talked about those things. We talked about uh, earlier, we mentioned uh, the Equifax thing. Now, if you and your organization had a breach and suddenly you lost staff at your breach as a result of that, how would that go for you? So let's look at Equifax. Who got a pink slip? The CISO retired. Incidentally, made $11 million in four years. I, I don't know how I get that gig. The CIO retired. CEO, I'm sure the CEO is fine. Nope. The CEO retired with a $90 million par parachute. But in one fell swoop, the entire senior management of that company was lopped off, ostensibly all of it, um, with the exception of the CFO. But imagine if that happened to you. And that's not to beat up on Equifax, that's just to use them as a lesson to look at what would happen in your organization if that went down. How would you recover? And we look at this, here's their competitor. The next day, we're suddenly serving up malicious, is it gonna show? Yep, malicious flash. This was the next day. So when you're looking at these types of things, you're looking at the cost involved. Did I just go flying by? Okay, the cost involved, you have to look at things like compliance. Often compliance is one of the adults in the room. Nobody likes to talk to them. I know I've done that gig in the past. But without compliance, you are not looking at the economic incentives for breaches. It, they can help you go through and understand the fines that could be incurred, as well as you know, making an, them an ally to get your job done, to help you build your business case in order to get your uh, organization secured. So failures happen all the time. <coughs> mistakes happen all the time. As long as we're learning from those mistakes, that's the best part. Um, in one point, I did a scan um, of this company, that, or this, uh, sorry, this attacker that was going after us. I was working for a defense contractor in the US. And my client was getting hit by this IP over and over again. And I just finally got fed up, and I hit back. I scanned them, I got in, I broke into their system, I left a note saying, if you want to get in touch with me, here's my, I gave them a burner email address and what they needed to fix, and then I left. A Couple days later, I got an email. I was like, all oh, feeling all self-important, and I was like, oh, great, you know. Well, thank you for the list of things that needed to be remedied. We actually didn't know about a couple of these things, and oh, by the way, you got the IP address wrong. So when you hear people talk about hacking back, this is not a way to resolve data breach issues. I had managed to go after a system, and I got one of the octets wrong. It was that simple. But it doesn't always, it, it happens all the time. I had one vendor come into me where I, when I was working as a, uh, a senior security officer at one company, and they said, look, we'll scan an entire block of addresses for you so you can go through and we'll show you what our tool can do and what can find. I'm like, fantastic, great. So they did a scan, and then they printed out a report. Yes, this was a while ago. They printed out a report and sent it to me. It was about that thick. And I was like, this is absolutely mental. And I started scanning through it. And I'm like, printers? There's so many printers. And why? Shanghai? Shenzhen? Beijing? The vendor had managed to get one of the octets wrong as well. So it can happen to anyone. And this is just it. We have to make sure that we're doing a far better job of this because the attackers are going to keep on coming. And if we can't get the basics right, then this is not going to go well in the future. One company I worked at, they had an application uh, that was going to go live, and they were supposed to come through security, and we were supposed to vet it, and then it would go into production. Well, it went live without coming to see us. So <clears throat> this is one thing I did. When I found out about it, I didn't lose my cool. I actually opened it up in the browser, and I said, all right, I did view source. Right there, that, and that. So 
seemed kind of simple, basic first step looking at a web application. It's like, see what's behind it. What was the first thing I found commented out in the code? I, I heard so many different answers there. It, yes, I heard that. It was the username of admin and a password of password. And this is access into a production system. Thankfully, it had only been live for a little bit, and nobody knew about it yet because they hadn't sent out any of the PR material. But guess what? When I showed this to the head app developer for that particular team, what did he say? You hacked my application. <laughs> I reacted sort of like this in my head, but I didn't do this because I realized he didn't understand. He was really good at running a team of coders. They knew how to code things, but I hadn't taken the time to work with them so they could understand what my security concerns were and how to better secure this. Thankfully, this actually transpired well. Nothing bad happened, but this shows that we have to do a far better job of communicating to a wider audience. Otherwise, it'll just keep happening. One company I worked at, this happened uh, about two weeks after I left. I got an email from actually somebody who's here. Um, I said, you're not going to believe this. Something we had fixed had changed, and I could dump the entire password from this particular company. And that's just it. People are going to use tools in a way you never imagine. And sometimes they'll use tools that don't do anything at all. And security bl blunders can happen to the best of us. <coughs> the first time I ever gave this talk, this happened to this particular company. I don't want to beat up on them, but it was just timing, absolute timing. Their entire database was tarred up. And when you have a data breach, it feels like Vertigo. And my friend Bob here, he went through this at Yahoo in a giant scale. And I, I really understand his pain now, but not at the level that he went through. And then we look at things like the Morris worm. The unintended consequences are going to continue to happen. Melissa worm was another one. That was a fun one. But we as security practitioners don't, shouldn't look at things as an adversarial fashion. We have to be there to help enable the business, enable your organizations, enable folks to understand the demo democratization of security so we can get them to be part of the solution. Don't align against yourself. Talk to folks like Internal Audit. Why? Because they can test your incident response plan. They can go through and look at the risks and benefits of sharing information with other groups and see how it can go. And also, you want to make sure that you are talking to folks in a concerted, a concerted way so they understand what the bad news is and how to properly take it. Don't run around with your hair on fire. I don't worry about zero days. Every time I see a zero day in the media, I kind of foam at the mouth because I'm more concerned about a 100-day vulnerability. How many people in here run Oracle databases in their organization? Don't put your hand up. When's the last time you put a poor, uh, Oracle patch bundle on? Been a while, huh? I've been in organizations where the Oracle patch bundles were not applied for three years. Why? Because the DBA said, it's my database, it's fine, we have a firewall. So what do you do? You have to start where you are. You have to look at what you have in your organization. You have to do a gap analysis of the things that you have. In order to avoid these data breaches, you have to do the work. And you have to look at things like patching. I know that sounds overly simplistic. It is not. It is a, it's, it's a painful experience. I've been through this far too many times. But you want to look at where you can stop the threats earlier because as we move into talking about zero trust in other organizations and make zero trust ostensibly is everything is on fire. We have to go back and do everything we should have been doing 20 years ago. That's it in a nutshell. Because organizations are constantly asking us to innovate. So we want to make sure that we have that framework in place before anything happens. Otherwise, we're going to end up with so many wars. And I think that's just cut it. It's back again. <coughs> and what can be seen as a, a curse when it happens, a data breach, it can also be a blessing. One organization that I worked at, we found a Cisco 1750 under the floorboards, or under the floor, under the raised floor in the uh, um, in the production room, whatever. <laughs> and it was actually connected back to a company that used to be part of the same company, but that company had been split into smaller companies. It was still a live interconnection. Nobody knew it was there. The only reason we knew it is because it started erroring out. That's how crazy things are. Data breaches are going to continue to happen, but we have to have a better conversation about it. We have to share information. We have to make sure that we're having a far better communication path to the folks who don't know and don't assume that they do. That being said, I would like to thank you very, very much for allowing me to sub in. And sorry, Wolf, couldn't be here. Thank you all for listening. And that's it for me.
I don't know if you have any questions, but if you do, I'm at your mercy. Oh, oh, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to run my own mic, I think. There we go. All right. Who was first there? All right, there you go. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You was first? All right, sorry. There you go. I just wanted to know if the wolf would be here tomorrow or? No, unfortunately, wolf uh, can't physically be here, and I can't go into why, but he'll, he'll be back again. So uh, arguably a, a silly question, but um, you know it's, it's easy for us to kind of get caught up in all the exciting tools that come out, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And uh, many folks are stuck in environments, or stuck's the wrong word, but are in environments where um, the conversations you you shared are, are, are very real, right? So mm -hmm. it's very difficult to sort of you know push the rope and you know yada yada yada. Um, in that context, would that not make um, so instead of always trying to kind of fight that seemingly losing battle, does that not make maybe a backup strategy the best approach? And then sort of taking sort of the the the, the stance that, yeah, it's inevitable that it's going to happen. Let's just make sure that we've got as robust a, a, a backup recovery um, you know, uh, art architecture that we can put in place. One that not only looks at uh, duplication, uh, but also at an integrity, uh, data integrity piece. Well, yeah, that's one of the key pieces of it. Uh, you have to also look at, there's so many other elements. Obviously, this was a short talk. But yes, there are all these different elements you have to look at before you get into it. The best one of all is one that no vendor can really sell you is process. Defined repeatable processes are going to make you, at your life a whole lot easier. It just it's painful to generate them because it's a lot of writing. It's work, exactly. Hey, oh, there you go. So from your experience, do you find that all these new regulations that are coming out are changing behaviors or just more knowledge or more, more knowledge to people to do the right thing? Uh, unfortunately, I see it as a lot of reactionary measure based on whatever the headlines of, of the day are. Um, some of them are, most of them overlap when you look at it. Like, for example, I can't remember who was talking about the unified uh, uh, conf compliance framework earlier today. That is a perfect example where you can see all the different uh, compliance regime, regime, reg thank you, regimes, <laughs> um, and how they uh, interlink. Um, I don't see that a lot of these are actually good. Some of them are actually very good. Um, I like GDPR not for the reasons of the fines or anything like that, but it's actually forcing organizations to be accountable for the data that they're stewards of. That good? Yeah. All right, cool. Anybody else, or you want to all stampede for the door? Oh, we got one down here. Where'd he go? Where, 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 where'd she go? Who, who's? Ah, there we go. Oh, and don't, hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't anybody leave. There's a, ra there's a raffle coming up. Yes. <laughs> uh, you had a picture earlier of a hand stopping a set of dominoes. Mm -hmm. what, what's your reaction? How, how do businesses work? Or like, how, how do they react when they stick the hand there to stop the dominoes from falling, but the dominoes are too tall and they still keep going? It, it's going to vary from one organization to the next. There is no one size fits all. So it really is an iterative process. So yeah, of course, there's going to be mistakes. I've made so many of them that I turned it into a career. Um, but that's just it, is you have to make sure that you're constantly iterating, constantly improving, because no vendor can go out there and go, here, this is a magic solution. It's going to make everything better. Um, there are tools that can help you accomplish your mission, but you can't just you know take them at their word. You have to make sure you do your homework before you ever talk to a vendor. And that's coming from a vendor. <laughs>